Hi everyone and welcome to Adobe Live from wherever you are around the world and welcome to this session today. Now before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live, create and learn on today, paying respects to Elders past, present and emerging. My name is Chris Hansen and I'm a Senior Solutions Consultant at Adobe in Sydney and I'll be your host for today. And joining me is Principal Product Manager for After Effects and Motion Graphics based in Seattle, Victoria Nice. Welcome, Victoria. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Now, what time is it over there? Uh, it is 6 p.m., so I'm doing this before dinner. Before dinner. Thank you very much for taking the time to be able to do this. Obviously, there's a bit of a time difference. It's 11 a.m. for me in Sydney, Australia. Um, but it's great to be able to do this, and I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We've got some cool stuff to talk about. Awesome, awesome. So firstly, I think it would be great to start with your role and exactly what you do. So could you tell us a little bit about what you do at Adobe? Yeah, sure. So I've been at Adobe for seven years now, which is crazy to realize because I came in as a motion designer. I've been using After Effects most of my life. Uh, and But in the last seven years, I've been really involved with the roadmap for After Effects. So mm -hmm. product management is balancing uh, business goals with what's possible with engineering, with the I ideals of design and putting all of that together and saying, what's the right thing for our users? What do people actually need? What are the problems that we can solve? And so that's that's really the focus of what we do. Mm, fantastic. And, and that obviously uh, leads itself into the product, right? In, in, in After Effects, after listening to the community and, and things like that. Yeah, and everything we do is really, I can put a, even a specific user's name on every single thing that we ship. Uh, and the features that we've just released are all things that uh, spent a long time in public beta. We took feedback in and we said, you know what, we're going to do something different. We're going to add something that people really need. And we iterate through and, and that's where our features come from is from things our users need. Mm, fantastic. I want to, we'll, we'll drill down deep in those because I've got a series of questions to talk to you about. But um, for someone with a motion background, how have you found motion evolve over your career uh, from what it was to what it is now, especially moving into social? I think there's a couple big changes. Uh, there's a term that we use internally, which is, it sounds very business-ish, but it's uh, content velocity. Mm -hmm. And that is, in short, it's the pressure to do more stuff faster on a tighter budget. And that there's this constant pressure to deliver more, deliver to not just social, but 10 different social platforms in 12 languages. And the scale of work that people are expected to produce is just so much bigger. And also creatively, motion graphics is kind of expected to be anything at this point. And so it's not just 2D anymore. It's 2D and 3D together. It's, it's video, it's design, it's hand-drawn. All of that gets pushed into motion. And so it, I think there's a lot of pressure on users today to deliver really high quality and to do it fast. Yeah. Very, it's a very good point what you say there about high quality and fast. So we do a series of events in, in Australia and we call them the make it events. And one of the themes was speed and ease, being able to do things quickly and being able to do that really simply, right? Um, and that's one, one of the themes that we've found um, across all the kind of creative areas that people want to be able to do. They want to get things done quickly and they want to get it out fast. That's right, um, yeah. As I mentioned, I've got a few questions lined up here, but I encourage everyone online to ask your questions and I'll be sure to ask Victoria them for you. Um, now, look, I'm really excited about some of the demos that you're going to show today. And some of these were released at the NAB show, which is the North American broadcasting show that's held in Vegas. Is that right? Yeah, it's a really big annual broadcast technology conference. Uh, I think this year they said there's something like 65,000 people. It's a big show. That's incredible. Um, 65,000. Yep. Wow. Um, and it's generally where all the video stuff for Adobe is, is released, all the all the major releases. Um, so I'm excited to see what you what you're going to show. Do you reckon you could we could have a bit of a demo? Yeah, we could do some demos. We got we got some fun stuff. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> So I want to kick things off with the properties panel. This is the big feature in lights for After Effects. Uh, and 
if you've never used After Effects before, I think it really changes the process of getting started. Because uh, a lot of our users come from Illustrator, they come from Photoshop, they come from other tools mm. where there's a properties panel. They already know what this is. This It, it just kind of works the way you expect. Uh, so I've got this nice big panel over here. That's my properties panel on the right. Uh, and I've got some social graphics for this coffee company. And we've been told, you know what? The brand wants to start going in a different direction. Let's Let's tone this down. And maybe I've been given this project by somebody else. I don't know where anything is in it. Uh, the cool thing about the properties panel, if I click on something, it's going to show me what I can do with that layer, whether I've twirled it down or not. Because, right. you know, I could go in here and find all the things I could do, but this is going to surface the stuff that I actually care about. Uh, so my background video, it's just going to give me my layer transforms because uh, it's a video layer. That's the basic stuff that you need access to. But if I want to go in and start editing my text, uh, then I start seeing, you know, I've got all of my type controls. I didn't have to go find the character and paragraph panels. I didn't have to twirl this down and go, wait, where is that? Oh, it just says yeah. source text. How do I change my font? I don't have any of that. It's all right here. And in fact, you've actually got control over how much you see here. So I can simplify this down if I just want to change the basics. But if I want to get more control, I want to do something like maybe I want to say, you know what? I actually want this name to be all caps. I can just do that here. Uh, so it's fully contextual and I still can do all my animation. Uh, and in fact, I can even get to my keyframes here. I can start animating. So I've got this animating in already. Uh, this text slides in at the front. And if I click on this little X position here, I can double click on this. Or if I want to say, go to a specific keyframe. Uh, in fact, I might've added one here by mistake. I've got this extra keyframe in here. Maybe I want to delete that. I can jump between keyframes here and it's just going to show me right right where I am in the timeline. If I want to start animating something that isn't animated yet, I can also, uh, let's, let's animate the scale. Let's do something really simple here. Mm -hmm. And again, I can jump around with these, these buttons. I'm going to add a scale keyframe. Uh, it's going to open that property in the timeline. I didn't have to twirl. I didn't have to figure out where it is. It's right here. Because that's, can... um, that's a number of clicks, right? That's like four or five clicks just to get there. <laughs> yeah. Just to get to find the scale property, it's 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 twirl, 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 find the scale property, click the stopwatch. Now you've got your keyframes, and here it's one click. It's just right there, uh, and this is a really simple example. And it starts getting a lot more complicated. Let's say we just want to add a nice little subtle change here. And so now, if I hit play, not only is this going to uh, slide in, but it's now also going to do a little nice little scale up at the same time. Yeah, nice. Um, There's so a there's been a question that's come through from James Hawley. Hi, James. I think I know you. Is there a way to use the libraries panel to set the color of a solid uh, with the properties panel like you do in Photoshop? Uh, so if you load your color themes in the libraries panel, you can uh, click, you can eyedropper them. Uh, so if I click on one of my shape layers here, like I grab this box background, uh, I have my color pickers right here. And this is where there's really way, way less twirling in the timeline. Uh, maybe we want to tone this down. We don't want it to be quite so colorful. I can click here and do that. Uh, let's make it a little lighter, something nice and neutral. But I can also color pick to my libraries panel and grab a color really quickly. Ah. So that's yeah. a nice way to do that. And again, if I was to find this in my timeline, it's all right. Let's go to content. Yeah, look at that. Shape. And then, wait, do I want my stroke color? No, I want my fill color. And there's my color property. And that's a lot of uh, mouse mileage between you've yeah. made a creative decision and you've actually made the change. And so it just really speeds things up. So I've got a question for you. I was just thinking as you were doing that, right? Let's say you're a motion designer. You've been using After Effects for a very, 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 very long time, years. How how would, do you see it, do you see it being adopted quite easily like do you see people changing to this new way of working or do you think they'll just re you know revert back to the old way you know what we saw in beta and this is holding up since this has been released uh we had this in public beta for a long stretch of time and by the end of the public beta period more than 70 percent of our beta users had built this into their ongoing workflows uh so mm. we've really seen rapid adoption of this and it's it's because it's contextual and it just it feels like it's been there all along uh, and so it's other panels you don't have to have open. You don't have yeah. to have character and paragraph panels open and close those and try to find things. Uh, and for shape layers, it really, really speeds up navigation and just gives you all the stuff you care about. 
Mm. Uh, and shapes are famously uh, not fun to navigate in the timeline. Uh, there's also another question here from One Piece 618. Uh, when will this feature be available for the public, AE 2023? It's available now, right? Yes. So almost everything I, I can show you here is available now. Uh, there, I am using the beta, and that's because there's one feature in the properties panel that is still in public beta, and that is support for essential properties. Uh, so everything else, everything I've shown so far, that is in the latest release of After Effects. You can update, you can use this today. Uh, you can also use the public beta today. And what essential properties is, and it's, it's one of my all-time favorite After Effects features, uh, is a way to surface the most important properties of a composition, like you were creating a Mogurt for Premiere mm. Pro. Uh, so here I've got this little bouncing coffee bean, and I can actually change how jittery it is. So let's let's make it really jittery. We're saying we're really, really caffeinated, and <laughs> it's going to start bouncing all over the place. It's actually even going to bounce outside of the little shape here. And maybe we don't want this to be jittery at all. In fact, we've been told to tone this down. So we're going to turn jitter off and then we can similarly go in and say, let's let's make this bean like a normal coffee bean color. So we, we've already made pretty dramatic visual changes in just a couple of clicks. And I didn't have to open that pre-comp at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All these properties are inside this pre-comp. And I've opened this up. I don't, I don't necessarily know where they are. Yeah. You have to go find those. Wait, why is this pink? Is this on this adjustment layer? Okay, I've set a tritone. It's this mid-tone property. I can just say instead, add this to essential graphics, and then it's going to show up when I come back right here in my essential properties. Right, so you're essentially favoriting uh, properties that you can have quick access to in your essential properties. Yeah, exactly. And the cool part of it is it's also non-destructive. Yeah. So if I've changed this color here, when I go back to my pre-comp, this is still pink. So I can create unlimited variations of this composition and they can have totally different settings. And you can get way fancier than just a couple of numeric values in a color chip. We've got media replacement in there. You can edit text, change the font, all kinds of stuff. And it'll all show up right here in the properties panel. That's, that's awesome. So what's the difference between that and creating something like a motion graphics template? That's more around creating something that to use later in Premiere Pro, for example, right? That's exactly it. Uh, yeah. If you're creating, it, it's the same exact workflow. Add properties to the central graphics panel. Uh, let's let's just add something here. Let's do something really silly. We're, let's add, I don't know, let's add a blur effect. That, that'll be easy to see. Uh, if I add a property here, and I want to be able to adjust this blur. You can say, add it to the central graphics panel. And you can see now in my panel, I've got access to the sliders, that color chip that I added, and now that blur radius control. I could export this right now as a motion graphics template and have a little coffee bean uh, that was controllable in Premiere Pro. Uh, I'm not sure I need that, but I could. Uh, similarly, I can go into my other projects here and now it's got that same blur option and I can, for some reason, blur a coffee bean. Uh, so it's exactly the same workflow. You can build a reusable template in After Effects or if you want to hand that off to an editor who's working in Premiere Pro, or if you're working in Premiere Pro and you want to have that simple interface for a template, uh, you can pack everything up into a Mogurt and then export that. And the same exact controls that you see here are available in Premiere Pro. Yeah, that's 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 definitely going to speed up a lot of workflows. I can tell you that. So if I'm not mistaken, those who use Photoshop should typically be familiar with the properties panel as it comes from there, right? Uh, it's a it's a similar design. So if you've used Photoshop, you've used Illustrator, you've InDesign, I think there's about six apps in Creative Cloud now that have properties panels, maybe even more. Uh, mm -hmm. It works exactly the same way. Uh, we did a demo internally to some of the marketing folks on the design side of the business and they went, wait, but where's the new thing? This is how it works, we thought. Mm -hmm. And because it just feels so obvious. And it's, it, I think it's yeah. really, really going to help make After Effects a little less... Uh, less scary, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's scary, but I do I, think there, I agree. Is, <laughs> there is a lot to learn and you have to know where everything is. And especially if you don't use it every day, you kind of have to memorize, wait, no, I need to twirl down this thing and then this yeah. thing and then this thing. Uh, this is You can kind of use this as your guide to the app. And I can then say, you know what? I do want to start animating one of these properties. Just double click, and now I can go right to my timeline. So it's, it, it doesn't replace the timeline, but it, it's your guide to the timeline. 
Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And just to add on to the Photoshop properties thing, it also kind of makes it a lot easier for those who are traditional graphic designers, I suppose, moving into motion design, right? Yeah, and we see that a lot. I think it's, it's, it's a way to level up your career. And we see a lot of more traditional graphic designers say, you know what, I want to put my work into motion. Yeah. Or I need to deliver for social. I want things to stand out. It, it's not always I need to go become a full-on motion designer. But building those tricks and techniques, learning some of that can really enhance what you're doing. And I, I think this is a great way to step into After Effects. Uh, and it's, it's also super useful. I mean, I've been using After Effects since I was 13. I use the properties panel all the time. And if I have to go back to a version that doesn't have it, I miss it. <laughs> you're like what am i doing in this version get me yeah. out of here where is it where'd it go it just it feels like it's been there all along it really does uh roland has a question how about being able to export a mogut for use within adobe express then allow a client to access that mogut online i think that would be cool i think that's a good feature request and that's a uh, good one to send to the Express team. Uh, I know how to post feature requests for After Effects, but that one, I'm sure they have a similar forum where you can say, I want After Effects Mogerts in Express. And cool thing is then you can get other people to vote up your ideas. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's a great feature request, Roland. Go for it. Um, James, yeah. James also says, no more remembering hotkeys. <laughs> I don't know. I, I still think it's worth learning the hotkeys. You can go really fast with keys, but it, sure. it does make it. There's lots of stuff in here that aren't even hotkeys for uh, line cap. There's no line cap shortcut, uh, that kind of thing. So it it, go, it plays well with the hotkeys. Right, so I want to talk to you about we touched on it just a bit earlier, but talk to you a little bit more about traditional graphic designers and getting into motion. Right. As someone who did this years ago, I found it equal parts scary and rewarding. Um, what are you finding that stops graphic designers from moving into motion? I think one of the biggest challenges is just that there's a lot of new terminology mm. and it, it's hard to even search for things you don't know what they're called. I think that can be a real, a real barrier is motion graphics is the intersection of design and video. So if you're coming from the design side, you've got half of it. If you're coming from the video side, you've got the other half. And so how do you know which bits you don't already have? And how do you take advantage of the skills that you've built up and the time you've invested to learn design? Mm. I think there's a lot of work that goes into that. And that's something we struggle with in figuring out how to make After Effects more approachable is how do we take advantage of the knowledge you already have? Because you have built a lot of knowledge of how professional tools work. And there's an advantage in that. And that means you can go faster. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, being someone... Uh, who was a traditional graphic designer in a sense, you know, being able to identify things that could, you know, be dynamic media in a way. So motion design, it really does reward you once you've, you know, done your first one or you see it out on a big screen somewhere. So I feel like seeing something go from static to more dynamic is definitely a lot more rewarding. Yeah, there's there's something really satisfying about just even just the first time you hit play and see yeah. something that you made come come to life. Like that's that is it's a magical moment. I, I see someone's a uh, recommended school of motion. Uh, they have wonderful training. Uh, there are many other partners out there that do really good training, but uh, we love the folks at School of Motion. Awesome. So have you got anything else to show us? You know, I wanted to show a couple of things that are a little more behind the scenes. Cool. Uh, I'm sure they're, everyone's going to love that. <laughs> yeah, because they're features that are uh, things to help you solve problems if you run into an issue. Uh, the first one of those is we now have an effect manager. So I go up to manage effects. And right now I don't have any third party effects installed. I have This is pure vanilla After Effects. But if I had them, they'd all show up here and I can enable and disable them. Uh, and that's that's actually handy if you're working with clients or you're working with a couple different companies and you need to remember which tools not to use because you're going to hand off some files and they may not have the same plugins. Uh, but there's a couple other things that this panel is capable of that are super important. Uh, first one is you can even manage the built in effects if you want. Uh, but there's this little column here that says last crashed uh, and another one says support URL. So if you run into a plugin where you, you have an issue with a plugin. For the first time, After Effects can now say, hey, 
we think this plugin crashed. And the next time you load, we say, do you want to disable that? Or do you want to continue to try again? And so you have that option. You, you get information you couldn't get before about what's going on if you ran into an issue, because it's, it's not always obvious what's going on. But what we get on the other side of that is a way to work with our third party partners and say, mm -hmm. hey, we found a crash and here's the data that you need to fix it. Uh, and we just had less than a week after launch, uh, someone's already produced a new update to one of their tools because we found a bug through this panel. That's amazing to That's get to brilliant. see that. Uh, so we're really committed to quality and stability. And this is a big way for us to build that out, not just within After Effects itself, but across the entire community that builds plugins. Uh, so we're, we're really seeing great dividends for this already of just that information to, to actually solve a problem, to know what's going on. And this little support URL column is going to be a place where our partners can put links to say, there's a new version. Uh, and so you might say, hey, I, I didn't want to disable this plugin, but oh, there's a new version. Maybe there's already a fix. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And I mean, that's a great kind of uh, way to kind of showcase our relationship with our partners because we really, uh, you know, make sure that we uh, have a really good relationship with them, especially with something like that, being able to communicate in that way and not only let the users know, but uh, the people that build the, app, uh, the effects as well, which is really good. Yeah, I'm excited for that. And similarly, we have a new startup and repair section in our preferences. Uh, and this is another thing of giving you tools to actually figure out what's going on. If you run into an issue, uh, if you start in safe mode, you can temporarily start with default preferences without blowing away your preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, it will also temporarily disable all your third party plugins. So you can see, is it my preferences? Is it the plugin? Maybe I need to update my GPU drivers because there's always a lot of things that could be going wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any information, you just kind of have to guess and you're like, well, uh, maybe I'll just uninstall everything. That's that never feels good. No and it, it's an awful lot. <laughs> it's often the opposite of productive. <laughs> and so, uh, this is going to give you yet again more of these tools. And similarly, if you crash after effects, we'll say, hey, if it didn't see a plugin, do you want to start in safe mode? We want to see if maybe something's going on with your prefs. Uh, so we're, we're just trying to give you the tools to, to solve problems quickly. I, um, I got a question about plugins. Don't know if you can answer it or not, but. Um... Any plugins that people don't know about that kind of should know about or do you recommend? Ooh. Oh, I feel I, I can't recommend just one because we've got so many amazing partners. Uh, in fact, I actually wrote scripts for After Effects before I started at Adobe. So that's very much my world. Um, but the thing I love about the community that creates plugins and scripts and extensions and all of that is so much of it is they're built by artists. They're yeah. people that really know what people need. And they're often going to solve workflows that may be one really specific thing. Uh, like I used to work in documentary. I did a lot of map animation. And I really wish that geo layers existed when I was doing that, because that would have made my job so much easier. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's like a great specific solution to a need. And so those kind of plugins we really love. Uh, that's, that's a lot of the stuff that's, that's super fun to see what people do. And, you know, we see stuff that sometimes the dev team even has moments of, wow, we didn't know you could do that in After Effects. There you go. Yeah. Some of the 3D stuff that I've seen people create in After Effects is actually quite, like, incredible, um, especially with sub the Substance 3D uh, suite of, of, of products. I, I feel like there's, like, a blur, like, happening, right? They're kind of, like, there's a bit of Substance in After Effects and that kind of thing. Is that something you're seeing a little bit more of or? Well, we will be seeing more of that. Okay. Uh, we've got some pretty cool 3D features in public beta right now. And there's, I will say there's more where that came from. Okay. Uh, so we've had a big focus on 3D over the last couple of years. And the stuff that's in the, in the release version of the app right now was really, we wanted to focus first on making sure there was a good user experience for working mm -hmm. in 3D. Uh, so we've made things more contextual. It's easier to navigate the screen with the cameras, shortcuts, there's a default scene camera now. Uh, and if you drop into draft 3D mode, you get ground plane and extended viewer. It feels like a 3D app. So we, we put that foundational piece of the 3D experience into the app. And now we've got 3D models coming in. And that's in, that's in public beta right now. 
and we're really excited with uh, what's next. There's some things I can hint at. I think I've got got a 3D demo in here. Yeah, I can show you. I do have one. Uh, this is a very simple little coffee bean, flying coffee beans, coffee packaging. Got this nice little quick demo. Uh, and I'm using the new Mercury 3D engine. And this is, you mentioned shared technology with Substance. This arrow, engine's an arrow. Uh, this engine is a shared Adobe engine built from the ground up for creative workflows. But it's actually a gaming style engine, so it's really performant. Like, there's a lot of speed in, and a lot of power in this engine. It's fully GPU accelerated, uh, and it's, it's fun to play with. Um, if I drop into draft 3D mode, you'll see here that it's going to change the image quality a little bit. And this will take just a second to spin up the engine for the first time. Wait for it. Hmm. <laughs> Taking a little bit longer than usual. Need some elevator music. Yeah, nice chill music. <laughs> oh, no, I'm beach balling. Oh, no. Oh, no. My demos, live demos. Ah, that's what I get for updating my beta build. <laughs> this is what's beach balling me. This worked fine a minute ago. Weird. <laughs> All right. Normally, draft 3D is real time and very, very fast. I don't well, know why can. I'm beach balling right now. Huh. Coming soon to a beta near you. Um, just so while that's doing, while that's still beach balling, maybe um, I, I had a question around, we talked about substance but and Photoshop, but back on the Photoshop thing, how has Photoshop helped After Effects and After Effects helped Photoshop? I have to relaunch my beta one second there. <laughs> uh, you know, every Creative Cloud app has pieces of the other app inside it. Mm -hmm. And so people start in Photoshop, bring their stuff over to After Effects. We need to be able to bring in layered compositions. The Photoshop engine is inside After Effects. And then once you've got things in After Effects, you start bringing them to life. And that's, that's where... After Effects really shines. It kind of is Photoshop for motion in yeah. a way. And that's, I, whenever I have to explain what After Effects is to people who aren't familiar with it, that's sort of the simplest way to explain it. Uh, and so all the Creative Cloud apps feed into each other. So then Premiere has After Effects as a library inside it to run motion graphics templates. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's kind of, it's this massive ecosystem, but we, we really try to keep things as tied together as possible so that you can really bring over what you need from one app to another to have the right tool for the job. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. And when when I went from static design into motion, I, I, I kind of identified areas in which that were quite similar and familiar to me um, when I first started using After Effects. But yeah, it was really it was really good to know that everything is connected, as you as you said, the ecosystem, right? And, and a lot of what you, if you know Photoshop, a lot of what you know from using Photoshop applies to After Effects. Compositing is compositing, whether you're doing it at one frame or 30 frames per second. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I've actually got the crash repair options up. Oh, if we want cool. to show this, I can show you what this looks like. Yeah, <laughs> so I've got this little menu here. It's just because I totally crashed there. It says, hey, we detected a crash. Could be a plugin, could be a preference. We, and it actually says, recommend starting in safe mode. Do you want to? just start with default preferences. And I'm going to continue because I don't know what would actually happen there and I'm going to relaunch. Uh, but I love that it gives me that option and gives me the ability to troubleshoot what's happening. And yeah. so that's a super handy feature. No, that's really good. Like you, you, you want to be able to understand exactly what just happened as opposed to, hey, I'm just going to shut down and not tell you anything. <laughs> yeah, and there's the moment of, is this a one-time thing or is this something that might happen yeah. again? Yeah. Let me actually grab just the 3D project. Let's do that instead. Let's see if this time it's going to let me load draft 3D. Here we go. <laughs> I, my hunch of what's going on is that my GPU is getting used also for the live stream. And oh, I think okay. I'm probably running out of GPU memory. That's, are you, that's my theory. Are you on an M1 Mac? No, I'm on a much older machine. OK. I wish I was on an M1. <laughs> it would probably be smoother. All right. Now we're going to try this one more time. Maybe something just weird with Draft 3D today. Yeah, you never know. <clears throat> and our, our beta builds are our daily dev builds. So it's entirely possible that something's come in here because I've been hammering on 3D stuff really hard today. Yeah, I'm beach balling again. All right, we're not demoing Draft 3D. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Time's a charm. What's weird is that the regular, the full full quality Mercury engine is running great. 
this is actually a feature, guys. Um, After Effects tends to crash every now and then, and nah, it's fine. We, we um, don't get into the process. It, it's obviously in beta, so um, yeah. those are the things that we're working on, and these things do happen every now and then. Um, this, is, this is a live beta build. So, live beta build. Uh, there you go. Trying to show yeah. some kind of good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you another question just to fill the gaps. Um, I noticed during COVID there was a bit of a trend on social of like neon motion design. Uh, it was really huge on social. What yeah. are some trends that you've noticed in motion and what could be the next big trend? Did you notice that trend? That was everywhere. Yeah. I don't know why. Everybody wanted, I feel, I feel like maybe people wanted something that felt like a party. But that was that was everywhere. And it's it's still going strong. And I see a lot of people doing sort of neon style things with some Gen AI tools. Uh, but actually, that's one of the new trends is people are starting to figure out how to use Gen AI with motion. And so we're seeing all kinds of really wild, surreal images created. Uh, and 3D is also really big and is is growing all the time. That's it's not just because we're building 3D into After Effects like 3D motion is is bigger yeah. and bigger. So the Gen AI, Gen AI in motion, how how what are the, what exactly? I haven't seen anything on that. What what are they doing exactly? So lots of people are just experimenting right now. Yeah. Uh, I've had a lot of fun playing with the text effects in Firefly yeah, that's and cool. uh, generating type styled type and then animating that. Uh, playing with uh, putting effects on top of it so that you can create animated transitions in and out of the type. Uh, that's that's been super fun to experiment with. Yeah. Do you see do you see type becoming more? of a trend moving forward, considering now we've got that Gen AI component of it? That kind of heavily stylized type. Yeah. I think we're really going to see that take off. Uh, and, and type is one of those things that comes and goes. As things had to suddenly go to every different platform and get cropped different ways, motion actually went a little toward less type. And now it feels like type is coming back and we're getting a lot more text and more stylized text. There was that one period of time where it was everything was just blocky serif black, uh, sans serif black and white yeah. and types getting getting its serifs back there's more styling there's both in just font choices but also now you're getting even beyond 3d type to like we just did a, a round table in london and we, we were experimenting with making the word london out of different things and someone said fried chicken <laughs> and so we made the word london out of fried chicken <laughs> wow london out of fried chicken that would have been amazing <laughs> it was really funny yeah, I think um, I think it's interesting because when I started as a motion designer, that's the, that's the first thing I started animating was type, and um, then I moved more into um, you know the parallax and the cinemagraph, which is interesting because you don't see a lot of that around as much as when it first started. It kind of came really fast yeah. and then it just went away, right? Yeah, there was sort of a cinemagraph bubble there for a bit. Hmm. Uh, there's a question here from Johanna. What is an emerging trend happening right now that you are really excited about? One that you're and one that you're not as excited about. <laughs> cool. I like that. I'll, I'll tell you one because we just talked about Gen AI. I'll tell you something I'm not excited about is seeing clients asking motion designers for here's a screenshot. Just make it like this. Use AI. Oh, not excited for that. I really think the role of the artist is super important. And also that's wildly overestimating what's possible right now. Just uh, use Gen AI. I just, mean just use Gen AI. No, <laughs> no. Like it's there's some amazing potential with some of this technology, but it's it's the potential for how can we use this as a creative tool to support an artist and their workflows, yeah. not to just say, just make it like this. Here's one still frame. Like, oh, that's painful anytime I see that. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of requests that, you know, working in the industry that I used to get that were really like similar to that used to blow my mind. Like, you know, just make that move, but in a really cool way. What does that mean? You know, yeah. <laughs> that means it's pop. completely different to what someone else thinks is cool. Um, yeah, okay, so, oh, Roland said, adaptive and responsive motion graphics toolkit, toolkits are going to be huge. I, I, I've heard Roland mention that many times. <laughs> I know that that is very much his world. Oh, 
there you go. Interesting. Um, all right. So have you noticed the latest um, update that has come to the Photoshop beta? Generative fill? That's cool stuff. Have uh, you tried it? I haven't gotten to try it yet because I've been on the road the last couple of weeks. Mm. And I've been watching all my colleagues make cool stuff and I'm, just, I've, I'm feeling left out. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to it. That's, that's on my list for, for next week to really get to dive into that because yeah, everything should. I see people do with it is amazing. You should definitely, yeah, you should definitely check that out. And I suppose it leads me to my next question. For something like that to come into Photoshop, being able to have a prompt and type something in, do you ever see something like that coming into the After Effects world? I think we have to figure out what's the right workflow. Yeah. Because it, obviously it's not make my video. So then what's cool about Generative Fill is the way that it, fits in with your larger workflow that you're able to take part of a photo and say i need to add something here and it's going to be aware of what's going on around it and that kind of thing is the stuff that i think is pretty compelling and so i think we we have to look at what's the right tool for the job when the tech is ready uh things like um roto brush is one of those things where we said we have to wait until the tech's ready oh wow this is a big step forward now is the time to take this so there's there's the question of like when is the tech mature and what's what's the right workflow to bring it in with, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I agree because you, you don't want to just jump on the Gen AI bandwagon, right? And it just it's just, oh, we're doing it now and it may not be the greatest, you may not get the greatest results and that kind of thing. I think testing it, being able to make sure that it's right um, and then getting it into the product when, when, it's, when it's, you know, at a, at a good spot is, is a good yeah. way to do it. Yes, that's totally it. Also, don't mind me, my eye is watering because they are cutting the grass outside right now and my allergies are going crazy. <laughs> oh, no. So I'm not crying. <laughs> you just love After Effects so much. I love it, it so much. So much. Ah. Um, one oh, P my allergies are terrible right now. <laughs> oh, good. 1P618 says, my favorite feedback I got in my career was, it needs to be more fabulous. <laughs> You know what? I bet you made it more fabulous. I'm you sure. I'm sure. I believe in you. I'm sure. I'm sure you made it incredibly fabulous. Yeah, that's that's very much true. Um, I remember once I got ad production value. <laughs> ad production value. What does that mean? <laughs> I think some people just pluck at, you know, things in the air and just say, right, I'm just going to go with that and let's see what 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 they come up with, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and it's. I'll know it when I see it. I don't really know how to ask for the thing that I have in my head, so I'll try something and until you get something you like. Okay, John asks, "Hey Victoria, what's next on the roadmap for three D models in After Effects?" Ooh, well, there's a really cool feature that actually just went into beta last week uh, that I am loving playing with, and it is the ability to use a model as an input to an effect. And so this is something that's super fun to play with. Uh, let me actually try it with this composition here. So I've got this coffee. Fingers crossed. And fingers crossed here this is going to work. I can actually use this. I can pull this even out onto its own on a solid. So I'm going to make a new solid. First, I have to find my solids, which has gone onto my other screen. There's my solid settings. Uh, and I can go in, grab my calculations effect, which is one of those channel effects that lets you just assign pixels from one layer to another. And in fact, I'm just gonna say, I don't want this original yellow, so let's invert that. And I'm gonna grab my, where's the actual coffee, coffeepouch.glb. And now I'm going to grab that 100%. I can pull this out of the render order first, which is pretty cool, but I can also start playing with this and applying effects to it. Uh, let's just do something really simple. Like we're gonna just, turn down the saturation because again maybe it's we want to tone down the oh, yeah. tone down the colors of this coffee company uh <laughs> i can pull this out and, and have it as a layer and that means i can have copies of this too so i could duplicate this and now this i can have another one in the background let's make a bunch of these uh we can start playing with this um yeah. and just just messing around have many many copies of a single 3d layer and if i start moving the camera here 
they're all gonna move. Oh wow! So it's gr- almost like it's grouped. Yeah, like you can do like weird three D instancing stuff. Uh, you can also use this if I want to do something totally different. Let's uh, let's just undo this. This is way too many coffee beans. Uh, let's just have let's just have one. Um, instead of doing that, I could let's let's do let's grab my Venetian blinds effect here. <laughs> We're gonna make some lines we're going to make them at a nice little angle and instead of grabbing this with calculations pulling it out as a copy i'm going to instead go to my displacement map and i'm going to use again that same coffee pouch and i can start displacing this texture with that coffee pouch and i can also mat this with a track mat so i can say you know what i don't actually even want to show that no yeah the rest of that and so now i've got a totally wild non-photoreal effect on top of this and it's just a couple of clicks because i can now use that model to feed into my 2d compositing pipeline so anything you can do with any other 2d layer you can now use a 3d layer to feed into that too and then you can like you did earlier you can duplicate that right and have multiple yep. versions of that yeah yeah and i can have versions of this that are just the uh, oh i've got this track method so it's getting cut off but I've, i can have versions that are just the um turn the mat off just that 3d streaky effect yeah. wow. so you can do some really wild stuff with this so we, we've been playing around a lot with that and coming up with creative things to do but i can't wait to see what people do with this yeah i, I was just about to say that i'm really really interested to see what people come up with that's that's going to be really interesting it's fun and you can also use this to make like surprisingly cool looking tune shaded style renders like if we grab this again even just very simply i can run the cartoon effect on this and uh maybe we just want edges so super simple to get now i've got a sketchy version of this and again it's still going to respond to the camera wow look at that so that's that's a ton of fun and i i feel like the real advantage of this is it's all live that you're able to do all of this without having to pre-render anything there's no going back and forth it's just all right here so Here's a question for you. Uh, people might be thinking, um, oh, I'm going to need like the best computer for this because this is really going to chew into my machine. What do you recommend? I get this question often. What do you recommend around, you know, being able to run After Effects at an optimal you know, speed? Yeah, we think it's about balance. Uh, it, we used to say before multi-frame rendering, it was, well, you just really want the fastest clock speed. You want a lot of RAM. Yeah. Uh, now I think you, you need a good graphics card and it's, it's graphics card plus a good CPU more cores is now actually better and you can get better results. Uh, but we also know that we have a really wide audience. And so we want to make things run well from the minimum settings up. But ever since we did multi-frame rendering, the big difference now is you, if you have a better machine, you'll get better results. And with the 3d engine, uh, a good GPU is, is going to be an advantage there for sure. Can you just explain for people who don't know what multi-frame rendering is? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest projects I think the team has ever worked on. Let me grab my preferences again here. Uh, enable multi-frame rendering. This mm-hmm. one little checkbox uh, was many, many years of work. <laughs> uh, what this is, is back many, many years ago, After Effects used to have a feature that was called something like render multiple frames simultaneously. And it would spin up a whole copy of After Effects for every core you had. And it was often actually slower than rendering on a single core. So this is a multi-year effort to make After Effects truly thread safe, able to run on multiple cores, and basically just faster. Uh, So what we've seen is consistently rendering is at least four times faster. If you have a really good machine, sometimes dramatically faster. Uh, and it's really about taking advantage of the hardware that you have available and doing so efficiently. So when you hit preview, you'll see that it'll give you a variable number of frames rendering at the same time, because there's a ton of analysis that went on behind the scenes to go, your project's this complex, you've got this much hardware available. All right, we think three frames is good right now, but then you've got a simpler area later, so we'll go up to eight frames at a time, and then this really heavy part later, we might even just want to go down to one or two. Uh, so it's dynamic how much of your system, how many frames it's using at once. Uh, it, it's pretty great. 
And it also has a feature where if I go into, uh, where is it? Preview, cache frames when idle. I don't have this enabled right now because I'm demoing, but when I check this box, this is multi-frame rendering running in the background. Yeah, and right. what this lets you do is, I'm talking to you right now, I'm not actually touching After Effects, and you'll see, watch that green progress bar there. It's going to do rendering while I'm doing something else, taking advantage of my system's spare cycles. Uh, and this is one of those things that can really, really speed you up having that enabled. Yeah, that's great. Because, you know, sometimes we get to a point when we're editing, whether it be in After Effects or, you know, Premiere, for example, we, you know, it's not it's not really keeping up with the way that you're working and ha having that happen in the background is 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 very powerful workflow. Yeah, and so maybe I've stopped to write an email, I come back and now everything is ready and ready it's fully go. green and I can just preview. So there's a question, another question from John. Uh, if I'm repositioning or scaling 3D model in 3D, do I have to pre-compose for it to work? I'm not quite sure what what kind of a workflow you're talking about, but you shouldn't need, with the new 3D models, you shouldn't need to pre-compose. Uh, and what I was just showing where I was making copies of the model, um, this is all within one comp. I have no pre-comps in here at all, except for the background. So you shouldn't need to pre-compose for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times though where pre-composing to do something complicated is a good option, uh, but it's not the only option. Yeah. Um... Okay, I got a question. So I'm as a solutions consultant, I get to work closely with our customers, right? And some of the questions that I get for requests are, will After Effects features ever go into Premiere? Or will Premiere features ever go into After Effects? I'm sure you get this as well, right? Is oh this, yeah. Yeah. Is this something <laughs> you're considering for any future releases? You know, we talk to the Premiere team all the time. They're uh, some of our closest colleagues. And uh, there are a lot of good cases where that has happened or where we've built features for both apps at the same time. Uh, very often, we, as we build something out, like the effect manager, we say, wait a second, this belongs in more than just After Effects. So that's right now in beta for Premiere because, you know, we want these features to be available in both. Uh, similarly, uh, one, one that came in fairly recently, uh, not going to work on this scene because... I don't have any videos in it, but scene edit detection, which yes. is currently grayed out. Uh, that's a Sensei feature that started in Premiere Pro. And we said, you know what? After Effects users get pre-edited videos they need to cut up all the time. Yeah. That's really common. Let's get that into After Effects as well. That's going to solve a lot of problems and speed things up. Uh, so it's as we build things out, we look at them not just as what belongs in After Effects, but what belongs where across Creative Cloud. Yeah, awesome. I think that's really good. Like to have, we go back to the ecosystem, right? Having, being able to work hand in hand with each other and understanding what, you know, users need at, with the tools that they're using every day. Yeah, it's, and, and our users are often the same people. I mean, we work across multiple apps. Yeah. Everybody's like, you, you have a motion background. You weren't using After Effects in isolation. Almost no. nobody does. And yeah. so it's funny, actually. I met you before you were at Adobe. Yeah. I yeah, remember you did. that. Yeah. I, I'm, I think I met you at Symposium. So in, in Australia, uh, in Sydney, um, we had an event, uh, an Adobe event called Adobe Symposium, which is kind of like a mini Max kind of version. And Victoria, you came and I was like, oh, the product manager for After Effects. Oh. How cool is this? I've got so many questions. <laughs> I remember people were like, you really have to meet this guy. He's super knowledgeable about Adobe tools. <laughs> and, uh, and then we heard, I heard Adobe had hired you. I was really excited. <laughs> yeah, nice. And now now I'm, in, I'm hosting you on Adobe Live. Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> That's really fun. Yeah. I, I, I really that. remember that. Yeah, me too. Um, all right, I think we've got a couple minutes left. Um, what can we expect from After Effects in the near future? Anything, anything you can share? Uh, I will just say, I'll, I'll keep this a little bit vague, but I will say that if you are, had a chance to experiment with some of the 3D features and you've wanted a little more control over how things render, uh, but stay tuned. We have some very cool stuff in the lab. Uh, we have a lot of work happening right now around 3D. That's a big area for us. Uh, and I, I'm very excited about some of the things that I've, I've seen in the works the last few weeks. So there, there's a lot on the way. 
Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're always looking for feedback as to what's more important, most important to do next. Uh, and so we have, a, we have a long backlog of user requests that we're trying to get in. Uh, things, uh, I've termed it a workflow wish list, and there, there's, it's lots of the little stuff, like the Colorama color picker finally uses the After Effects color picker. That's a recent one that just went in, but we're trying to tackle a lot of these smaller things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to label keyframes with colors is one from last year that yeah. people have hundreds of requests for that. And yeah. if you have a big project that's super complicated, it makes it way easier to figure out what's going on. So those kinds of features, uh, that's something we're really focused on right now and getting more of those into the tool. And so uh, please send us feature requests. We're always looking for more of those, like things that will make your day better. Yeah, feature requests. Who was it that said it before? Was it Roland? Some, I think it was. Feature request. Um, we got, I think, about one minute left, but I want to ask you, we didn't talk about this, but Frame.io oh, uh, yeah. in, in After Effects. Not many people realize that it's in After Effects and it's yes, actually it a really powerful way to help, you know, uh, with work. Is this, can you talk a little bit about Frame? I can. Oh, I'm not signed in right now. and I'm not going to type my password on a live stream. Uh, Frame is built in to Creative Cloud now, and uh, it is a great way to do review and approval. I've just actually been talking to a couple folks who use this on a massive event with millions of viewers. They reviewed everything via Frame. That was a very cool story to hear about. Yeah. Uh, but what I like about Frame is it's deeply integrated in a way that means if you get feedback, you can pull it into your timeline. You can put comments on markers. So it's much more immediate and it's actually frame accurate so that you're not just going, wait, where's that email over here? And I've got the Slack message here. And somebody has a shared Google doc of notes over here. It, it brings everything into one place. And so you can see what's going on and you can share different versions and see things as they evolve throughout the project. Uh, so there's a version of frame that comes with Creative Cloud. And then there's another version of Frame that's bigger and more advanced for enterprises that really need a more robust architecture there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've been working closely with our new colleagues from Frame, and it's it's great to have them as part of the Adobe family. Yeah, it's it's seriously uh, a treat to present and demo when, when when we get an opportunity to do that with our customers, especially the camera to cloud component where you can essentially shoot footage. And have that come directly into a timeline it's it's like magic stuff right yeah it's really cool to say between that and text-based editing coming into premiere and yeah. mogerts and everything else that's happened i look back to my days of documentary and i'm like we would have been able to deliver a month faster <laughs> full know. month faster i know i said the same thing when um select subject remove background came into photoshop because oh, one of the jobs working in media was literally to get the pen tool and cut people out. <laughs> I did an awful lot of that too. It was cutting people out of archival photos, making them 3D, just to have that nice little sort of Ken Burns camera move. Yeah. Did a ton of that. All right. Well, that's it for today, Victoria. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for talking and for coming online. And I'm, sure, I'm sure it's dinner time now for you. <laughs> yes, I'm hungry. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. This has been great. Um, it's it's fun to get to nerd out, and I hope we get to spend time together soon, maybe sometime in person. I know. We should definitely do that. Hopefully Max or something yeah. sometime in the future. Maybe if we have something here. Or, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, give me an excuse to come to Australia. I had a good time. Done. We'll do it. All we'll right. make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.